you know, Terry, I'm walking around and I'm going, how the heck did they get the oysters from the bottom of the river? And tell me about this machine. Well, most of the time they were actually in the bay getting the oysters. Oh, out in the Delaware Bay. Mm -hmm. Not here. Okay, they gotcha. Had, interestingly, they knew their grounds. They knew where their spot was that they oh. were allowed. And then mm -hmm. the next person would have this ground. So you oh, had your own grounds and you didn't oh. have any business taking oysters off somebody else's Okay, that's ground. good to know. They would get the, this is a dredge. And they would... Um, is it made out of metal? It's made out of uh, heavy metal. Oh, wow. It's made out of metal. And it was, um, as you can see here on the wall, the dredges were made by blacksmiths. And each of these little circles and each of the little S's, see the S up higher there, mm. the little S's would be, have to be heated very hot and be pounded together. So this dredge started out as little circles and little S's. I imagine they had to make the S's too. Oh. And they made this and it's uh, made by a blacksmith. It's very heavy. It has teeth on the bottom and they would have, you know, big chains and everything. Throw these overboard and drive the boat slowly dragging this along the bottom along the oyster and then beds. they would have an apparatus that they wind wind it up and then men had to be strong a couple guys on each side get the thing up it's all now it's all full of oysters and mud and wet right, and, right. very heavy and windy and cold and everything else out and you got to dump the thing on the boat and they dump it out on the deck and then they throw her back overboard and do it some more but when they get a big pile of oysters on deck but they have to get down on their hands and knees sort all through them a lot of times they'd be two or three oysters stuck together. They'd have to knock them apart. Did they get, did the smaller oysters fall through? Or did they have to, oh, they'd have to they'd chuck the them. smaller ones yeah, back in? Yeah, the smaller ones, they let get them back grow, over and get bigger. Let them grow mm -hmm. bigger. Yeah. It just seems to and me. sometimes they just get just shell and not oyster. It seems to me like it would be easy for an oyster to just kind of pass right through. But yeah, I, I guess they well, caught it in a way. In the clump of mud and everything else just kind of some of them were gonna get caught and they would they would sort of and a lot of times they would just have just shell or just uh you know right just like that. sand or grass or whatever is whatever else is down there yeah that's amazing and here they are there's a picture of them dredging up yeah. and you see in that or... photograph there's the the winding apparatus they have oh to, uh, right okay like a winch mm -hmm. and two of them would get on that on either side because it was that heavy Oh yeah, it was. It would be very. It's heavy now. Try. I mean, if you this one's probably bolted down, but. <gasps> <laughs> but they're scattered around. I mean, they're hard to pick up empty, and I can't imagine full of mud full and being on a uh, really. moving deck and trying to get it up there. Got to have a lot of muscles to do that. But um, they did it, and um, they could make some pretty good money oystering back in the day. So. Well, thanks for telling us about that. Hey, we're in another part of the museum. Um, tell us a little bit about this part. Well, this is one of the original uh, 30 shipping sheds that was mm. built by the railroad company. And different businesses were held in, in these uh, establishments. They would rent on upstairs and downstairs and hold whatever business they wanted. A lot of it was oyster planning and um, oyster shipping and stuff like that. And Mr. Yates was uh, either in this shed or the next one over was where he was established. And he had a business. But there was... Uh, he had a mysterious end to his life. Oh. And, um. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's very mysterious. <laughs> and I know <laughs> we joke sometimes. Tell me a story, <laughs> Terry. <laughs> I'm not really sure what happened to Mr. Yates, but he walked out one night, late at night, and um, it tells us over here on the board, but um, fell into the water on purpose, accidentally, I don't know, but he passed away. And, um, but for years they say that he haunts this area <laughs> and I know that we've had uh, over the years we have this door sometimes will just be open huh. when we know that we locked it oh. or something like that and in the shed right next door to this one there's a light bulb that it'll just go out and we replace it or it'll come back on again we could turn the switch on all oh, the lights on and then one light bulb will be on and one will be off and, be cool. <laughs> and that happens a lot it happened yesterday as a matter of fact or mon Monday, yeah. Are so. these those are those special light bulbs, the curly ones, <laughs> or are they no, the old no. old ones? It's just a light bulb. <laughs> so it's a lot amazing. of a lot of interesting um, 
I could see why somebody would want to stay in this place if they, you know, had their whole life and business. Yeah. And it's such a nice spot. But, ooh. Hey, everybody. This next book is called Wake Up Crabby. <laughs> it's kind of funny because we use the term crabby for somebody that's maybe not so happy or don't be so crabby. But it can also mean a crab. So Wake Up Crabby. And it's by Jonathan Fensk. So this is called The Dream. Tonight is just another night at the beach. That crab looks kind of crabby. What do you think? But look at the moonlight reflected on the water. Isn't it beautiful? The tide on my toes, the grit in my gills, the foam on my face. It's enough to make a crab crabby and sleepy. <gasps> So the crab falls asleep and a little shrimp comes by like, what's that? Are you asleep, Krabby? I said, are you asleep, Krabby? Yes. Oh, okay. Wait a second. Are you sure you're asleep? Yes, I am sure. What makes you so sure? Because I am dreaming. Oh, I love dreams. What are you dreaming about? I am dreaming about peace and quiet. <laughs> Poor Krabby can't catch a break. Peace and quiet, that's boring. It is just a dream. When I dream, I dream about fun things. I dream about rainbow slides and narwhal rides and magic seashells and flying fish dust. What the heck is a flying fish dust? And clownfish cars and jellyfish jars and dolphin dances and, and, and Krabby saying, Grrr. Okay, okay, I'm not asleep. Well, you should be asleep. It's very late. Krabby's like, oh, what the? And this story is called The Bath. Hey, Krabby, I just took the best bedtime bath. Look, he took a bath in a shell. And Krabby is saying, yippee. He's very underwhelmed. Do you want to take a bedtime bath? We live in the ocean. We don't need baths. Trust me, you need a bath. Do you want to smell like a stinky crab? Newsflash, I am a stinky crab. What if it was a nice hot bubble bath? Sea creatures should not take nice hot bubble baths. Why not? And Krabby said, ask lobster. Oh no. Lobster was remembering the time that his dad took a nice hot bath. And he's saying, Papa? Because sometimes that's how we cook lobsters to eat them, right? By putting them into a nice hot bath. No! But look at all the shiny bubbles! And crab is just like, whatever. And the little shrimp is like, come on, Krabby, will you please just take a bath? Fine. Plankton, you really want me to take a bath? Sorry, I thought it was a shrimp, but it actually is Plankton. And Plankton says, yes, then I will take a bath. And Plankton says, yay. But you cannot watch me take a bath. Silly me, he's covering his eyes. And so Krabby takes the shell and he pulls it and he's actually taking the bath. Where is he taking it? And he skips it out into the sea and it lands on a sandbar 
and it gets a seagull all wet and the rubber ducky lands on the seagull's head. <laughs> and Krabby says, all done. And the plankton says, wow, that was fast. Remember, he had his eyes closed because, you know, giving Krabby a little privacy. And then Plankton says, wait a second, where is the bath? And Krabby said, I took it. Ah. <laughs> and another story, and I think this might be the last one, is called The Song. Hey Krabby, will you sing me a bedtime song? Look, Plankton has a little teddy bear. And Krabby says, no, Plankton, I will not sing you a bedtime song. Mm, Plankton is thinking, he's thinking, and bing, he has an idea. Will you hum me a bedtime song? No, I will not hum you a bedtime song. Will you whistle me a bedtime song? No, I will not whistle you a bedtime song. I guess I will not hear a bedtime song. And he gets really sad, and he's sad, and he's just sad. And wow, it sure is quiet. And Krabby says, sure is. Remember, he likes peace and quiet. And Plankton said, some might say it's too quiet. Okay, Plankton, I get it. You want me to sing you a bedtime song? And Plankton says, I sure do. I guess he thinks he's coming around to the idea. Fine, I will sing you a bedtime song. And Plankton says, yay. Ladies and gentlemen, Krabby will now sing a bedtime song. <laughs> like he grabbed a microphone. Excuse me, and, and Krabby says, this song is for Plankton. And Plankton says, you're too sweet. I call it a bedtime song. I'm all ears. I want and a two and a, <laughs> a bedtime song, a bedtime song, a bedtime song. <laughs> and it blew poor little Plankton, Plankton's sleeping cap and teddy bear right out of the water there. That's not a very peaceful bedtime song, is it? Oh, look, there's one more story. And guess what it's called? Yes, that's right. It's called The Story. Hey, Krabby, will you tell me a bedtime story? And Krabby's sitting here reading a book called Scuttling Made Easy. <laughs> like how to be a crab for dummies. <laughs> no, Plankton, I will not tell you a bedtime story. But I can't go to sleep without a bedtime story. So Krabby's thinking, hmm... So if I tell you a bedtime story, will you go to sleep? And Krabby said, uh, Plankton says, yes. Do you promise? I promise. Then I will tell you a bedtime story. Yay! And he slammed his book shut because he's like, ah, I can't believe this Plankton. Once upon a time, ooh, nice beginning. There were two best friends. Me and you? Their names were Whale and Plankton. And Plankton says, oh. And they did everything together. Like me and you? And they waved in the waves. Hi. They surfed in the surf. That's my surfing position, you like that? They sunned in the sun. Ah. They had a wonderful time together. And Plankton said, woo -hoo! Then Whale got hungry. And Plankton says, oh, poor Whale. Whale's tummy rumbled. Rumble, rumble. And Plankton says, time to eat. The Whale's tummy grumbled. Grumble, grumble, grumble. And Plankton said, get that Whale some food. So the Whale opened his mouth wide and dun, dun, dun. and gobbled up plankton ah snap <gasps> the then whale wasn't hungry anymore the end the end 
That was a terrible bedtime story. Why? Because bedtime stories have happy endings. It was the happy ending for whale. Listen, Krabby, best friends do not eat each other. Do they? And <laughs> Krabby was like, They might if they were really, really hungry. Gulp. Krabby, are you really, really hungry? No, silly, I'm not really, really hungry. <gasps> I'm just really hungry. What? Sleep tight, Plankton. <laughs> and Krabby had a really, really good sleep. Well, Plankton stayed up and wondered if he was going to be a midnight snack. Was that a fun book? All right. And here Krabby says, these books are not funny. There's a book called Barnacle is Bored and Plankton is Pushy. Maybe we'll get those and read them next time. Wasn't that a great book? Yay, wake up Krabby. So next we're going to read, since we're in a a lovely setting here at Bayshore Center. We're going to read about the monarch butterfly. Why, you ask? Because it's a very important butterfly. And it's important that you plant things like milkweed and butterfly weed in your backyard to attract the butterflies where they can lay their eggs, grow their little caterpillars, turn into butterflies, and keep on doing their thing. So, monarch is the king of the insect airways. Do you know why they call it the king of the insect airways? I'll tell you. Unlike other butterfly species, monarchs can't survive long, cold winters. So, guided by the length of day and the temperature, North American monarchs can travel up to 3,000 miles. A butterfly. 3,000 miles on an incredible migratory journey to Mexico. Each individual monarch will make the trip only once during its lifetime. The migratory paths, the way they take to get somewhere else, are always the same each year. And two major paths run along our eastern and western coastlines. During the course of their journey, they always roost communally and fly in masses. It means that they stay together. Monarchs choose traditional resting spots along the way where they will roost and feed on the nectar of flowering seasonal plants such as seaside goldenrod. Human admirers attracted by the quiet and colorful spectacle, they stop to watch and photograph the long distance flyers. Fall is the best time to observe this amazing undertaking. So that could be right now. You could look and see a bunch of monarchs. We're also going to read about another species called the Northern Diamondback Terrapin. It's a turtle. And this story is going out to Jason because we know he loves turtles. Hi, Jason. The Northern Diamondback Terrapin, a vulnerable, a vulnerable diamond in the marsh. It's a really cool turtle. Uh, I hope you get to see one in person someday. Of all the species of turtles in the world, only the northern diamondback terrapin is exclusively adapted to the coastal salt marsh. The terrapin is an agile and alert swimmer and can live for 25 to 40 years, feeding on clams, snails, mussels, oysters, and fiddler crabs. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, terrapins were hunted nearly to extinction. This fact, along with the loss of wetland habitat, places the terrapin among the most threatened of all coastal animals. They also face a host of other dangers. Many are hit by cars on their way to find a sandy spot to lay their eggs, and thousands more drown in commercial crab pots. Conservationists are launching intensive and creative efforts to reverse the decline in terrapin populations, such as requiring turtle excluders on the crab pots 
However, more needs to be done to save this beautiful and vulnerable species. Terrapins. And our last story from this book is about a beautiful bird called the oyster catcher. I mean, since we're at Bayshore Center at Bivalve, we have to talk about a bivalve, right? So here is somebody that loves oysters, a boldly patterned shell seeker. The oyster catcher gets its name from its favorite food, the oyster. It uses its large bill as a tool to pry open these and other bivalves. Oyster catcher chicks are able to see, walk, and feed themselves within hours of hatching from their eggs. That's pretty cool. Imagine if you could do that when you were a baby. These, uh, this self-sufficiency is just one example of how resilient these maritime birds are. Unlike many coastal animals, the oyster catcher has been able to adapt and flourish in a wider and wider range. Once found only in isolated areas of the southern Atlantic coast, oyster catchers are now found as far north as Maine. This wading bird is easy to identify along the shoreline, jetties, and tidal mud flats. Look for the long, bright orange bill and listen for the loud cleep of its piping call. The oyster catcher. Yay, great book. It's called The Book of Seaside ABCs by Barbara, Barbara Patrizzi. And it's entitled O is for Oyster Catcher. All right, and our last wonderful book that we're going to read today is a very fun one. And it's about another crab. It's called Bezgetti Spaghetti. Hey. It's by Susan Vettinger, illustrated by Marie Ann Raber. Who ever heard of a crab eating spaghetti? Have you ever heard of that? I don't know. I like spaghetti, but I'm not a crab. I can be crabby though. <laughs> Bezgetti Spaghetti. Oscar the little crab was on his way to school. As he scuttled along, he sang a song that he made up about spaghetti, the food that he loved best in the world. Oh, I love, love, love spaghetti. It's scrumptious and delicious and really so nutritious. That's why I'm always ready to gobble up spaghetti. Yum, 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 yum. That was a good song, wasn't it? Oscar had once tried to teach his classmates the rhyme, but Oscar had a problem. When he, whenever he was nervous or excited or frightened, his tongue got all twisted and he jumbled up the words like I sometimes do. Blah, blah, blah. So when he recited the rhyme in front of the class, it came out, Oh, I love, love, love biscotti. It's some treeus and delicious. It's really so nutritious. That's uh, so why I'm always dreading to boggle up biscotti. Yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. And how the other students laughed. They thought it was a joke. But he was just trying to sing his song. This morning, as Oscar scurried across a green reef, a shark popped out in front of him. The shark was huge with sharp, scary teeth. Arr. Oscar was terrified. He hid behind a sea urchin, peeking out now and then. After a while, the shark swam away, and Oscar, all six legs trembling, hurried as fast as he could to school. Hey, sharks gotta eat too, you know what I'm saying? His teacher, Mrs. Pembleton, was waiting for him. You're late, Oscar, she said. Oscar was so excited that he started sputtering, jumbling everything up. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mippleman, I mean Mrs. Pepperton. I mean, well, there was a fermocious schnark. It was Gigantimus. And I, I hid behind a sea munchkin and, and... And all the students started laughing at him. Then Mrs. Pembleton just shook her head. No one believes me, Oscar thought sadly. He was so upset that he ran away. That's what happens sometimes when you get nervous and people laugh at you. That's not nice. Should make somebody feel calm and comfortable so they can express themselves. 
So just remember, be kind. Some people have trouble sometimes. Oscar found a dark cave where he could be alone. He settled down in the sand and cried and cried. He was so unhappy. Right next to Oscar lay Susie the sweeper fish. She was sound asleep. She had been busy all day dusting off all the reefs, vacuuming up the ocean floor, pruning the seagrass. Susie rolled over. Her feelers brushed against something strange. It was Oscar. Hello there, I'm Susie. Who are you and why are you crying? I'm Oscar, he replied. And then he told Susie all about the shark and how he jumbled everything up and how the others laughed at him. I just wish I could talk right, he said with a sigh. Come with me, said Susie. I know someone who can help you. That was nice, I think he found a friend. Susie carried Oscar on her back. They crossed the coral reef and on the other side, a dark and majestic sunken ship lay. Oscar stared, amazed. There was a sign on the ship that said, Dr. Octopus, speech fixer. Wow, that's great. They found somebody that maybe could fit, help him with his speech. The octopus came right out to greet his visitors. This is my friend Oscar, said Susie. Maybe you can help him. He has a small problem. She made an elegant swoop in the water and said goodbye to both of them. He's shaking his tentacle. Well, let's see what we could do, said Dr. Octopus. He led Oscar into his cave. A long time ago, a real pirate lived here. This was his hat. Try it on and look in the mirror. Now you're Captain Oscar, arr, the dreaded pirate, arr. Make the scariest face you can. <laughs> a little shy at first, then braver and braver, Oscar made faces, horrible faces. This is great, he thought. I feel like a bold buccaneer. If only his classmates could see him now. <laughs> Yay, Oscar. Very good. Excellent, said the octopus. Would the captain like to come up the mast? Oscar looked up at the tall mast. It looked very scary. Come on, give it a try, said Dr. Octopus. He lifted Oscar in two of his arms, grabbed a telescope in another arm, and used the rest of them to climb up the mast. When Oscar was sitting safely on top, the octopus handed him the telescope and climbed back down to the deck. He drew a picture on the chalkboard. See all those things that are happening there? Look, it's a jellyfish. Which sometimes I refer to as an octopus. Tell me what this is, he called to Oscar. Oscar was trembling. He was so high up. Nervously, he replied, Fife Reserver. Not bad, said the octopus. Take a breath and try again. Rife Reserver, said Oscar. Mm, yeah, I'll never be able to do it. Yes, you will, Oscar, declared Dr. Octopus. Try singing it and pat your neck at the same time. Life preserver. Good job, Oscar. Keep going, said the octopus. He drew another picture. Try this one. Oscar kept singing and patting his neck. Life, prefer life preserver. See, I'm having trouble. Life preserver. Life preserver. Shark. He sang out loud and clear. I did it. Bravo, Oscar, cheered Dr. Octopus. He scampered up the mast and carried Oscar back to the deck. There sat a little cannon. The octopus explained a new game to Oscar. To Oscar. <laughs> I think I need Dr. Octopus. Whenever you say a tongue twister correctly, you get to fire off the cannon and try to knock over the cans. <laughs> it was difficult at first, but before long, Oscar was reciting really hard ones like, Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Gee, I could say that, but I can't say Oscar. And see, she's, oh, this is gonna be a hard one. 
She sells seashells by the seashore. I'm going to try that one again. She sells she, she, <laughs> she sells seashells by the seashore without making a single mistake. He loves shooting off the cannon, and he managed to knock over a lot of cans. Yeah, yippee! Good for you, Oscar. That was great. What should we play next? Ask, uh, asked Oscar eagerly. <laughs> the octopus winked. Let's look for a pirate treasure. They hunted all over the ship. Finally, Oscar found a big black box. Inside were hundreds of golden letters filled with chocolate. What? Take as many as you want. You've earned them, said Dr. Octopus. Weeks went by. Octor Oscar visited Dr. Octopus every day. He knew lots of good games, and Oscar did so well that even when he was nervous, his words all came out perfectly. And every day he was rewarded with more golden letters. I think I could use some speech therapy today. Finally, Oscar was ready to go back to school. His teacher was glad to see him and to celebrate his return. She made spaghetti for everyone. It was a great spaghetti party. At the end, everyone sang Oscar's spaghetti song. Even Oscar, and this time he sang every word correctly, except for biscotti. <laughs> Yay, that was great. Yay, I'm going to give that book a, a solid eight. That's right. So uh, stay tuned for what's coming next. Thank you so much for paying attention to this, these wonderful stories, and we'll see you soon. Hello, how's it going? Arr, ye matey. Arr. We're going to do a craft today because since we're going to be on the around Bayshore, I'm just assuming that everybody that was an oyster fisherman was also a pirate. So, <laughs> but they're not, not really. They're hardworking fisher men and women and people. So, but pirates are fun. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to make a pirate out of a toilet paper roll. And I have some stencils that I'd cut out already that I just found online. I just Googled pirate stencil and they gave me this situation here, which are two boots, two arms, and a sword, and a pirate going, arr. So we're gonna color those in, but first we're gonna wrap his body. And I figured these pirates are pretty colorful folks, so we'll use some cool colors for our pirate. So let's make put his accessories <laughs> over to the side there while we wrap our pirate body. Yay, so we're gonna use a glue stick, and we're gonna use that to make his very colorful self here. So what I'm gonna do is just cut a strip. These could be his pants, right? This could be his top. So we've got some pants, we've got a top. And we also have this really cool napkin that I found with an awesome stripe on it. So we're gonna use this in some form or fashion, maybe for his scarf, or maybe as part of his clothing. I don't know, that's what's the fun of crafting. You can be experimental with it, and you can use your imagination as you go along. So let's start with his pants. Purple pants for the pirate. Get some glue on there. Remember how we wrap? Yes, exactly. Get some glue on there. And start wrapping them up. Make sure that bottom is where it's supposed to be. That looks like we used a little too much paper today, but that's okay, because the paper will go over the paper if you know what I mean. Okay, there it is. 
get in there and make sure that that's nice and tight. There's our pirate pants. Purple pirate pants. Can you say that six times fast? Purple pirate pants. Trim that baby a little bit. And we'll do some glue action on var and on var she blows do you know what that saying means that means that they've seen the spout of a whale out to sea Thank goodness they don't kill whales anymore like they used to because we love whales and we need them to be out there to make more whales. So there's your pirate. Arr. So I think I know what I'm going to do. All right, I'm going to come in with the longest stripe that I could find. And we're going to wrap it around the middle because he's going to have a sash so he can hold his sword. He has something to stick his sword into. Okay, and we'll also save a piece for his head wrap. We'll put that over there. Maybe we'll use this piece for his head wrap. Ah, oh, that's a colorful pirate if I ever saw one. What do you think about that? What do you think about that, Mr. Pirate? Arr, it's the finest fashion I ever wore. Arr, I must have got it into some exotic portacol. Arr. Okay, so we're going to put his sash on him like so. Because it's a napkin, it's probably going to require a little bit more glue. And hopefully I've we have enough to wrap around his entire little toilet paper roll body. Okay, we'll see what that looks like. Arr. Arr, little lower. Arr. There you go, lassie. Oh, it doesn't quite fit, but you know what? That's okay, because this is the back of him. As long as it meets a little bit and can hold, hold itself on to our pirate. Arr. All right, so there is our pirate body. And now what we're gonna do is, just let me see if I could, if I could flip this around a little bit, because the seam is right there. Look at that, our pirate's just moving around. Arr. Okay, good, nice. Now we're gonna color in our pirate. And for that, I'm gonna be using some of these lovely magic markers over here. Interesting colors, Crayola, you got it going on. So we're gonna do some red. We'll do his scarf red. We'll do it red and gray, because we wanna get the stripes in there. Or should we do it red and purple? What do you think? I think red and purple will look fabulous. It could be our designer pirate for the day. But you, this is your pirate. You could do whatever color you want. Come in again with another red stripe, or hey, how about a gray stripe? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. He's a very, very fashionable pirate. He's setting the tone for his ship. And so, here, we'll do one of these red. Because that's the end of the scarf, right? And we'll do the other one purple. There we go. We're going to color his glasses in yellow because for some reason this particular pirate has aviator glasses. Maybe he got them in a trade somewhere. Oh no, that's his eye patch. What am I talking about? I don't know. Maybe we'll color his teeth in yellow because they didn't really get to the dentist very often. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we'll come back in and we'll color his eye patch teal because he is just one fashionable dude. There we go. Eye patch sunglasses, you know, whatever. Okay. There's our pirate. What else is that? What do you think that is? I don't know, but I'm going to color it gray because maybe it's part of the scarf. It's probably an earring, but no, I don't know. So there's our pirate. Arr, he looks mean, doesn't he? Arr. Come back in and what do you think we should do with his... That's right. He's going to have a purple sleeve. How did you know that? You folks are so smart. Because even though he's a dastardly villain out on the high seas, looting and robbing, he's got to look good. Because that's what counts. And he looks marvelous. There's our guy. And what about his boots? What color should we do his boots? I'm thinking we can do them. Now that was boots multiple and now I only see one. So what happened to his other boot? Uh, here's his boot. His boot tried to leave us. We're gonna do his boot in gray, but we're gonna start with a little red buckle. That's right, little red buckle. How about with a yellow in the middle? What a styling pirate we've got. And after this, we're just going to glue these little bits and bobs onto the toilet paper roll body. And then we'll be pretty much done. So even if you don't have access to where you can print these stencils off on the internet, you can draw boots and hands and a head. I know you can, and a sword. Just need a pencil and a piece of paper, that's all. You can do it. And if you feel like you can't do it, get your adult to help you. And if you are an adult watching this, get your kid to help you. <laughs> And I just want to give a big shout out to all my wonderful friends and family who've been tuning in to the story times and the crafts. I really appreciate you uh, watching this and taking interest in it and supporting us and giving us some really great feedback. I hope you're enjoying our efforts as we go to different wonderful, exciting places around the county. Um, what color should we make the sword? Let's make it yellow to bring you interesting visual delights and educational and entertainment. Because that's what we're here for. We're here to help you learn, help you develop interest in things, perhaps outside of what you normally may be interested in, and to show you all the wonderful places you can go and visit in Cumberland County. That's what it's all about. All right, and we're going to make our very fancy sword red on the top. Yes! That's what I'm talking about. Look at that sword. How cool is that? It matches his teeth. Okay, so we're going to take our pirate head, and we're going to put a, a little bit of... We're going to do glue stick, because this is a flat piece of paper, and I think it'll work. We'll just pretty much put it right in the middle since it's gonna go on a round object. Mm. There's his head, Arr. Look at his head. Looks a little angry, that's okay. He'll cheer up once he's all together. We'll take his arm. We'll just do glue stick on the top part of his arms so we could put them off of his body. So it looks a little more interesting. Hey, get out of my way, arm. Arr. He's lucky. He has both of his arms and both of his legs. You know how some pirates are peg leg? I don't know why that is, that a lot of pirates seem to lose their limbs 
on their journeys. <laughs> I have no idea why that's a thing. So there's his arms. Arr. Maybe we'll make one of his arms pointing up. Looks like he's dancing. He's doing his Saturday Night Live impression. I mean Saturday Night Fever impression. And for his boots, I don't know, we can just sort of put them on his body. Something like that. Get the other one going. Remember, if you do cut out boots, make sure, or if you do color your boots, make sure you have ones that are pointing the opposite direction. So they look like his feet. All right, look at those legs. Kind of looks like a cartoon of himself, doesn't he? And where should we place his sword? How about right across? Okay, like right about there. What do you think about that? All right, this is great, wonderful. So look at your pirate. Do you love your pirate? What do you think, parrot? Err. <laughs> Arr, I lost my eyepiece. Arr, I can see him with this eye, though. Arr. Oh, it looks good. What's your name? I'm Captain... Captain Black Toe of the pirate ship. Arr. It's just called Arr. 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 Okay, let's go see. Okay.